Hello fellow time travellers, as always it's a treat to me to have you with me, to know that I'm not just uh, talking into an empty jam jar, <laughs> such a, I don't know, a reassurance to know that there's people out there, that there are people out there uh, who have at least some of the same wiring inside their minds as, as I do, that there's, we have something in common uh, in the three and a half pounds of rosy pink meat that we have underneath thin caps of bone on tops of our shoulders. Um, I su- ultimately, this this uh, this vodcast podcast is all about it's all about the past. I'm an archaeologist by training. Uh, I'm also a lover of and enth- an enthusiast about history. Anything to do with things gone by is soothing to me. Uh, it, it, it has always been my way, I suppose, f- maybe first of all subconsciously, but more recently consciously, I, I've realised that where I can't make sense of what's happening around me, and I really can't make sense of what's happening around me at the moment, let me assure you, I seek answers in history or in the past from the point of view that we haven't changed very much in the last 200,000 years, physiologically and cognitively, we're the same animal that, that hunted the wild beasts of the, of the African savanna. Our circumstances and our technologies and cultures have changed enormously, unrecognisably, but, but the animals that are moving through it, which is us, we're the same. So it seems to me that solutions that people found in the past to big challenges like plague and war and conflict and natural disaster and existential angst, the answers that worked for people in the past and let them nudge a little bit further forward into the present, into the future, some of that must surely help us. So whatever the problem is, I like to look back, see how people coped, see how events played out and see if that helps me. Um, that's really the, the, the philosophy that, that underpins this whole endeavour. So thank you to everyone who signed up to my Patreon site. If you don't know about it, I can tell you how it works. Patreon is based on a subscription model. Uh, you, you join up, you part with some folding cash, uh, you become a member, uh, and that contribution then helps everything else that I do on here. Other podcasts that have been, are, and always will be free are made possible by the Patreon uh, contribution. Uh, by being part of the Patreon community, you get access to extras, other rewards, other content. Uh, as a, a, this, the centre point is a vodcast that I record every week with Paul. We run competitions and we, we invite the community to come up with ideas for specials. There's always stuff going on. Uh, it's a thriving community, getting bigger every day. Uh, so if you want to become part of that community, go to patreon.com, search for me by name, Neil Oliver, and sign up. Uh, okay, now it's time to strap into the time machine and we can set off for the next stop uh, on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. Some bugger's going away with your towel and your jewellery and your clothes and there you are standing naked and cold. Curses! Get them for me! Get them for me, Silas Minerva. In this podcast, we're crossing the channel with legions of heavily armed, well-trained Roman soldiers. A conquering army, bringing the modern world with it. Forms to fill in, records to keep, taxes to pay, straight roads and central heating. When they landed in 43 AD, the Romans became inextricably linked with the story of these islands and our influence on the world. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil, in the last episode, 
you took us to Inishmore, an island off the west coast of Ireland, home to two incredible Iron Age forts. Where are we this week? We're in a place that's home to an awe-inspiring natural phenomenon, an enchanted part of these islands, where you could say that two gods came together. Sulis, who was a native of these islands, and Minerva, from the Roman Empire. We're at the Roman Baths, at Bath, down in England's deep southwest. This week's a bit of a, it's a bit of a departure for me. This one, and I say it's a bit of a departure for me because when I was a, a student at university studying archaeology, and I, even before that, I always found the Romans a bit strange and difficult. Um, you know all that stuff about uh, what the Romans did for us. You know everyone knows all the jokes about long straight roads and central heating and you know but there was something about them that always rankled with me always kind of put my back up a little bit and while of course I was able to see that they were an extraordinary world phenomenon uh, the way in which uh, it was assumed that they had arrived in Britain and just made it better sorted it out like an unmade bed <laughs> <laughs> just kind of bothered me because by the time the Romans came there'd been people here in unbroken line for thousands and thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years if you if you think about it and the idea that we were all just sitting about in a swamp with our thumbs up our bums <laughs> waiting for the Romans to, to arrive and, and make the roads right it just used to bother me a bit People do love the Romans though, don't they? They do. There's camps of people that are particularly fascinated by one bit of it. It's like the Tudors. You know, there's the people that are obsessed with Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and, and so on and so on. And, and they, they, they can't hear enough about it. And we're, we're never far away from another TV drama about the Tudors. And in a similar way, there's just something... It's understandable. I mean, the reach of the Romans, they were like, they were like nothing else that had ever been in our company. And they did. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, for good or ill, I think we, we admire them and, and bang on about them the way we do because they brought with them a, a version of the world that we recognise as modern. In a lot of ways, the world that we recognise now of, you know, of people with forms to fill in, taxes to pay to the man, uh, long straight roads, central heating, uh, all of those formalities are still with us now. So it's like they arrived with an IKEA flat pack version of, of modern and unpacked it and bolted it all together for us like one of those wee white bookshelves. And we just say, oh yes, we've been waiting for this all along. This has made our lives better. So there's good reasons why, why they, they register so much. People with jobs, official them. People obsessed with and, and seeing the importance of keeping records and keeping lists. It's all, it's all Roman and it's with us still. And before that, I think there's this assumption that things were just messier. Which, depending on your point of view, I suppose maybe they were. Uh, but it's obviously it's a gross oversimplification to say that. But anyway, it meant... So here we are, in a long roundabout bath. You said, where are we today? So for me, we're in, we're in Roman bath. Uh, but we're also in a strange place. Because it's, it represents to me the, the coming of, of modern into a world that in so many ways is, is wonderfully and fascinatingly strange. And I, 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 I sort of miss the strangeness and the, and, the, and, the, and the absence of all the formality. And, and once, once the Romans come, everything's, everything's different forever. What was Rome like when it invaded the British Isles? Rome was already old, up and running, all its structures and, and everything was there and it had already cast the shadow of its hand over the ancient world. It, it was everywhere. You know, they were in Africa, they were in uh, you know, the, the Middle East, they were all across Europe, they were all around the Mediterranean. And, and so by the time they came here, there were already connections. We were, the people of the British archipelago were aware of Rome. 
and everything Roman before Rome came and conquered us. So it spread across a, a century, really. Julius Caesar, he was in Gaul, which is to say France, for, for want of a, you know, a simplification. And he was disinclined for all sorts of reasons uh, to go back to Rome. He's a very political animal, Caesar, and he was always waiting for the right moment to do the things that he wanted to do. Now, this is in 55 BC. Uh, and so he decides to take a pop at conquering the British Isles. Uh, and so he takes, he, he goes across with some, with some soldiers uh, and it's a bit, well, it's a bit ineffectual. He has a bit of a fight with the locals down in the south east of England uh, and he gets kind of chased off. And then he tries again. He has a second attempt almost immediately and that doesn't amount to much either. And then it all goes quiet, but the point is that by the time Caesar was doing that, there were already connections between the people, especially the people closest to Roman Europe, the people in the sort of southeast of the country and the south coast of England. They already knew about, Ro they were already drinking Roman wine uh, and, and they were probably, some of them were already adopting some Roman ways. They might have been dressing a little, a little bit like the way people quite fancy the styling of the Kardashians, you know, and so the girls start doing their makeup like that and, and trying to look like them. There, there, was, there was certainly a bit of that going on. Before Caesar arrived, people, by their own choice, adopting things Roman. So Caesar had a go. It didn't, it didn't amount to much. Caesar went back to, went back to Rome. He was, although he hadn't conquered Britannia at all, uh, he was he was received with great uh, with great um, affection back in the back in the Roman capital, and then of course everything else that happened to Caesar happened to Caesar, and the the formal connection to to Britannia didn't happen then for the best part of a, of another century. Uh, by forty one A.D. right so fifty five B.C. and then you wait 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 and then around forty one A.D. Claudius Tiberius Claudius becomes the Roman emperor. Uh, it, uh, by a bit of a palace coup, really. He took over from his nephew, who was Caligula, and he was a, he was a very slightly built, s small, thin chap. And he had a limp and a bit of a speech impediment. And he, so he wasn't very prepossessing from the point of view of being a, an emperor. He wasn't very imperial. So <clears throat> for political reasons, he knew that he had to do something quite spectacular. He had to have a moment that would, you know, cast him as somebody to be taken seriously and, and to show him off as a, as a man who can get things done. So he dispatches some legions under the command of Plautius to the British Isles. So they go across and they're successful. He sent enough people, they were committed. A lot of the heavy lifting though was done by a, a young and ambitious general called Vespasian. Vespasian is instrumental in, uh, in, in, the, in the conquest and he's a young man who will in time become emperor himself but he certainly shows the, the cut of his jib uh, during, that, during that invasion under, under Plautius. You get a real sense also of something else that's very modern uh, in, in the fact that under the time of Caesar, way back in 55 uh, BC, uh, he had had he had come in contact with a, a chief of a British tribe called Commius, and Caesar struck up a rapport with him and had him as a kind of a puppet back in back in Britain. He was a chief of the uh, the Atrabates tribe uh, in what we would call Hampshire, and Caesar used them. But of course, Caesar's invasion didn't come to anything. But then, all that time later, uh, under Claudius, one of Commius's d descendants, a, a chief called Verica, came crying to Claudius, basically asking for help because he was being bullied by a much more warlike neighbouring tribe called the Catuvaloni, and they were threatening his territory. And, and so because of the long thread of, of connections all the way from Caesar and Commius, and then Claudius took it on, he sort of inherited the obligation to, to these people and this was the this was the trigger that he used to justify taking his army into the British Isles under Plautius in 43 AD because it was 
Uh, he was he was helping out a friend, basically. That's how he was able to dress that up. But it's an indication of the way in which the ties were already there. And and for some for some people, for some important wealthy people in the British Isles, it was advantageous anyway to get the Romans in for their own political ends. You know, so it's not as if everybody in the British Isles was against the conquest, not at all. For some people, it was the desirable next step. You know, so that the ground had been laid. For, Cla for Claudius in many ways and he was able to manipulate the, the ambitions and the aspirations of powerful men who were already in strong positions in the British Isles they were already, they were already chieftains you know, so you can see how modern that feels about people exploiting powerful allies and, and using them to, you know, for their own uh, personal ambition even when it might have wider consequences that are not necessarily in the best interests of your neighbours you know, there's something very, there's something very modern about that. But in, but in any event, from from 43 AD, the the Romans were here, and they stayed for good or ill for about four centuries. Which is a long time. Which is a very very long time. It's all, it's hard to imagine. I mean, the, the the union with with the EU, with the European Union, it's only forty odd years old. So. So you're talking about being run by the Romans for ten times that long. The conquest took decades, 30 years really, before the, before the, the Romans uh, were in any meaningful control. And even at that, they didn't ever get control of Ireland. They were in Ireland, they went, they went there, they knew all about it and had connections to it, but they didn't conquer it. Not in the same way, and they didn't conquer Scotland, although Scotland didn't exist. They, did, they didn't conquer the northern part of the, the Long Island of Britain, in many respects, because uh, the, the, the Romans were very practical, and they, they did calculations and said, you know, to put enough men, say, into the north to, to conquer it and keep it conquered is expensive. And anyway, what do we stand to gain? What's up there? Is there a lot of gold? Is it very fertile? Do they have something that we want? And basically they did the calculation on the back of a Roman envelope and thought, no, it's not worth it. It's too expensive to, to occupy that territory. And that, 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 so that's why they limited themselves to Hadrian's Wall, Antonine Wall a bit further north for a little while, but re realistically they just thought, no, it's not worth it. And, and something similar. They just, they, they concentrated all their efforts in that where they knew they could get stuff they wanted. You know, so obviously by, by, by conquering the southwest of England, they got themselves all the tin. And there was gold dotted about as well. There was a certain amount of lead. You know, these were all uh, elements, uh, uh, minerals, metals that the, that the Romans needed and wanted. So they bothered to take control of, of those places. And the other thing that was genius about the Romans everywhere, not, not, not just in Britain, was they were very pragmatic. Uh, all they wanted was... For the, for the local people to accept the emperor, just accept the emperor. Just, if we ask you who's the boss, just say the emperor and, and, and make sure you pay all your taxes in gold and don't cause trouble. And if you do that, most of the time we'll just turn our backs on you and you can do what you like. You can pretty much do your old thing. But if someone in a toga asks you who's the boss, say the emperor, pay your, <laughs> pay your taxes on time in gold and we'll... You know, you can get on with it. So it was a very pragmatic approach to occupied territory. You know, they didn't try to make everyone do the same things, wear the same clothes, eat the same food, worship the same. There was a nod to that, but they weren't serious about it. As, as a practical business corporation, as a massive corporation, they just wanted wealth. They just wanted access to valuable things, edible things, useful things. And if, if you didn't get in their way, they, there, was a, there was a great deal of latitude. Now, it, that finally, after hours and hours of meandering, you know, let, let's just think about Bath or the, or the place that we talk about as Bath. Uh, and most people will, will know of it. It's a, it's a beautiful city of honey-coloured stone, lovely buildings, uh, lovely architecture. Uh, you know, it's surrounded by hills. It's very, very attractive it's a lovely place, but that's a, that's a kind of an 18th century 
we'll sort of roughly start in there, veneer over the top of something that's much, much older. Um, and when the when the Romans reached that part of the, the southwest of their territory, they encountered the hot springs. And at that time, it was nothing but hot springs. There were no buildings, and there was no great city there. There might have been a settlement in its vicinity, or there was, because it was under the control of a, a tribe called the Dabuni. And it was a magical place, because it would have been, especially in winter, the hot water there, but it would have been wreathed in, in steam. Uh, the water, when it comes out of the ground, is about 40 odd, 45 degrees, as we know, which is bath temperature. Uh, it's also stained red. There's, there's iron uh, and other minerals in the water, so when it comes out, it stains everything red. So it may well have looked to people like blood. It, 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 it may have been interpreted as the, as the world bleeding at that point, or, or indeed a god or a goddess deep underground whose own lifeblood, whose pulsing hot lifeblood was coming into the world at that point and maybe adding to its power, adding to its fertility. And it was certainly interpreted for a long time as a place that you would go to and, and take the waters and bathe in the waters and if you were ill, you'd be made well. So before the Romans came... It was always... I mean, if you imagine... Imagine hunters. Imagine tens of thousands of years ago. Imagine a time when, the, when we were still a peninsula of northwestern Europe and people were just walking back and forth following the herds. The water was flowing then. And for anyone encountering it, it would have been magical. The Romans only ever in their entire empire found one place where water was coming out of the ground in quantity hot enough to bathe in. That was at Bath. They had never seen anything like it. There's a, there's a couple of places. There's a place in Ireland. There are, there are other, a, a few spots where warm water comes out of the ground. But, in Britain. In Britain, but 20 degrees. So, so nothing like the comforting warmth of Bath. So Bath was, Bath was unique to everyone that saw it. Hunters of the Paleolithic, right the way through, to the, to the tribes who were living there in, iron, in the Iron Age, who had inherited it from, from the hunters that went before and the farmers that went before. And then when the Romans arrived and they encountered it, they had never seen anything like it. What you've got going on there, geologically speaking, is pretty miraculous. In some respects, what is simply happening there naturally is, is almost more fascinating than anything else that's going on. The rock is carboniferous limestone. Those hills, the lovely hills that kind of cradle Bath that, in that landscape, it's carboniferous limestone. And that, that means that that rock was laid down uh, as the seabed of a, of, a, of a sea. Millions of years ago, you've got, you've got little creatures uh, with shells that die and they, they, they sink to the bottom and their, and their shells become rock. And then the world moves you know, geological time spans unfold and what had been a seabed is pushed up and is now above the sea and is dry land. Then rain falls, rain falls on the land. And of course, it, the rain percolates down through the rock. And in the case of that carboniferous limestone, it, it percolates down, when it goes down about 8,000 feet, geothermal processes, the heat of the core of the planet is enough to heat that water. And by the time it's at 8,000 feet down, it's being heated to a temperature of about 60, 65 degrees, which is too hot to touch. I mean, you could cook with it at that, at that depth. And the, the, the carboniferous limestone is laid down in horizontal layers, but then geological movements mean that they're also vertical cracks that geologists call joints. So, so when, the, when the water is down, that heating makes it rise. It starts to rise back up along, along the horizontal layers and then into the joints and then it rises up and it's losing heat as it, as it comes up through the rock. By the time it comes to the surface and comes out where we can see it, it's at this lovely balmy 40, 45 degrees. Right. It's a miracle. The water, if you go to Bath today, 
the water that's coming out now, gushing out at that temperature, fell as rain from Stone Age skies. That's, that's rain that fell, let's say, 8,000 years ago, that latest arrival at the surface. It fell as raindrops 8,000 years ago when people in animal skins were hunting the deer in the dappled forests. And now it comes back up and people, you know, can touch it and experience it. Now, for, for, for me, that's, that's more... I find that more spine-tinglingly fantastic than anything else that's happened at Bath. Just that simple, natural process. So, you put yourself in the mindset of anyone that encounters it, and it seems to be a miracle. I mean, to be honest, even for a 21st century modern person, when you go and see it coming out of the ground, and you put your hand in it, and it's hot, it's like, that. it's childlike, isn't it? If, yeah. if, when you see it and touch it, you think, this is, this is a trick. So imagine anyone anyone, especially people that didn't have the science of geology and who didn't have modern understanding of geothermals and all the rest of it, who are simply confronted with a unique place in the landscape where water comes out of the ground so hot you can lie down in it and, and think what that would do. So when the, when the Romans encounter the Dabuni tribe in that part of, the, of, of England, although, you know, it, the Romans called it, the Romans called the place Britannia uh, because that's what you call an ethnonym, Linguistically speaking, which is to say, if you imagine when the, when the Roman people were first encountering the Long Island and they would have said to people, what do you call this place? It's a natural question to ask. Where are we? The answer w w seems to have been something like Pretani, with a P. Pretani. And with the, that way you do when you're on holiday and someone, a local says a, foreign, a, a word to you in their foreign language and you try to repeat it and you probably don't get it right because it's not your language, but you make your best stab at it. So Britann, Britann, said the Romans for Britanni, and the locals must just have nodded at them and said, yeah, yeah, that's good enough, <laughs> that'll do. And so it becomes Britannia. So Brit Britannia is, a, is an ethnonym, which is to say it's, a, it's a, a person's attempt at pronouncing a foreign word. So it wasn't that the Romans named... They didn't, just, they didn't just invent that. They didn't just pull it out of their big book of Roman names. So Britannia, in essence, is a very, very old, in the same way that the water is, that's coming out at Bath fell as rain 8,000 years ago, so, the, so the, the, the very name of Britain is soaked into, the, soaked into the landscape long, long ago, at a time that nobody bothers to remember. So we think about Britannia being a Roman name, but it's not. It's an old, old name that they just adopted more of their pragmatism. That was the Roman way. You know, if that's what you call it, well, that's what, that's what we'll call it too. And so, like, so likewise, they, um, they turned up at, at Bath, saw the, saw the water coming out and asked the local people about it. And the locals said, well, there's a goddess under the ground there, which was thinking that the Romans could get on the same page as, you know, because they had a pantheon of gods and goddesses themselves, as we all know. So to hear about a god or a goddess, is, that makes perfect sense to them. And the locals said, we call her Sulis. And she is, uh, she is our goddess of, of health and well-being and wisdom. And the Romans thought, well, we know her. We've got a goddess of well-being and, and wisdom. But we call her Minerva. But it's surely the same goddess. You've just, and this is her home. You've actually got her here. She lives here where you... She actually lives under the ground where you guys are. And so, by a pragmatic process, they said, we will just... Um, we'll share her, because we know her. So they called... They called the name that the Romans had for, for this place was Aque Sulis Minerva, the waters of Sulis Minerva. So they kept the, the local's name for the goddess, kind of with a hyphenated, double-barreled name. They called her... Well, she's Sulis Minerva and Aque Sulis Minerva, the waters of Sulis Minerva, which is kind of so much more elegant sounding than Bath. Where did that, where did the god come from? Our god? Sulis. Yeah. Well, it's a, it would appear from what we can, obviously the first people to write anything down were the Romans, you know, because they had, they had Latin and they, they wrote things down. And before that, we don't know what people were thinking because they weren't, they weren't writing it down. 
in any form that we can interpret today. But the whole process, things that we've discussed before, Hlinvaur, where swords and such like were being put into the into the water of the lake as as sacrifice, as appeals, for thousands of years, back to a time we cannot pinpoint in the past, people all over the world and here, for want of any other religion, they were trying to understand the workings of the world around them uh, in terms of invisible forces whose effects and powers they felt subject to, but that they could not see. Things happened. The wind blew. The rain fell. Sometimes terrible things happened. A devastating storm or or a flood, or, or there'd be years when the harvest wouldn't, when the crops wouldn't ripen or they'd be destroyed. And those invisible forces were, were interpreted by people. They think it's transcendent. They're thinking there are forces in the world, but we just can't see them. So, and, and those become, by a logical process, they start to be personified as, as gods and goddesses. Clearly there are invisible things around us all the time and they have an effect on our lives. Maybe we should try and strike up a rapport with them. And, and, and so you start giving, giving them things. Let's give them part of this year's harvest so that they'll reward us by a bigger harvest next year. Or let's give them some swords, precious things that we need. And they'll appreciate that because they'll, they'll have seen how much we need these things. So for us to put them into the river or into the lake and never go back for them, the gods will reward us for that. And so by the time you get to Sulis being imagined at the place we call Bath, it's, it's people making sense of what they can see. This magical, hot, reddish water that stains the ground all about, that looks like blood, so that the world seems to have an open wound here. What else can it be but some transcendent, invisible power? You know, for want of science or anything else, those are the kinds of explanations that people come up with. So the tradition that the waters had healing powers goes right back. Well, yes, it, it, there always has. I mean, people still, you, you talk about taking the waters at Bath and other places. When you go, as you know, it smells sulphurous. You know, it's got that slightly bad eggy smell, which is part of fun because if you think, we know for a fact that it smelt just the same to the Romans. That was a smell that they knew. I love that, or the or the or those ancient Britons that were that were there in the in the first place. That's it was always that smell, and it was always that temperature. So when you put your hand in that water and smell that smell, you're literally breathing, l- inhabiting the same environment that they knew. But th- th- there's 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 sulphurous and other elements in the water, and people have always associated it with with getting better. There was a, a, a 12th century English historian, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and he wrote a history of, of Britain. And he had picked up an explanation for Bath, a folk tale. Uh, and his explanation had been that there was, around the 9th century, there was a prince called Bladud. He was, he was of the royal line, but he had leprosy. And so he was, he was um, driven out of his society and had to go and live as an exile. And he went away and lived as a pig farmer. And he, But just as good luck would have it, where he settled was close by the, the hot springs. And he noticed that if his pigs ever had a skin complaint on them, if they went into the waters, they came out cured. And so Bladard went into the water, and after three immersions in the water, his leprosy was cured. And he went back to his kingdom, became the king, and... They all lived happily ever after. Now that was that was just Geoffrey of Monmouth's f- folk tale to explain the origins of Bath. But people have always it, it may well have. I mean, it's been associated with cures from everything from lumbago to piles to, to uh, you name it. Some people will tell you that if you go and bathe in the waters at Bath, you'll feel better. And who, who knows? You know, maybe the placebo effect. I mean, maybe if you go there with the right faith. Your body will cure you because you believe that the waters of Bath will cure you. There is no doubt that there's a whole psychological thing going on there. You know, physician, heal thyself. You know, there, there is that m- mental element to getting better. And, and for some people, the trigger to helping themselves get better 
It just had been this strange smelling warm water that they could bathe in and drink. That's why it's seen as the as, as being the outpourings literally from a goddess who was all about health and wisdom, but, but primarily health and well-being. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a story, it's an interpretation of that water that's as old as the species. No doubt, no, no doubt Neanderthals and everybody else that encountered that water was mystified by it because it still has that power. So, so you know, so the Romans, and in the, in the way that the Romans are, where something that had just been a, a wild, untamed presence in the landscape, the water came out, you went to it, you bathed in it, you drank in it, you worshipped in it. But archaeologists find all manner of things, pre-Roman sacrifices, that had, you know, swords and jewellery and other things that obviously the Dabuni and other pre-Roman peoples had been offering up to the water. But the Romans built probably first in timber. The, the, so, they, so they built themselves bathhouses because the Romans were all about the bathing. So this is great. This is so, they, and they took and they they took control of the water, and so they m- made sure that there were places where there was hot water, cold water, plunge pools, and all the rest of it. And they, in that Roman way, they sort of formalised and and Im- imposed order on what had been just a natural feature in the landscape. I mean, the buildings that are there now, they're, the Roman baths were lost. And after the Romans departed in the 5th century, the town that they had built at Bath was fell into disrepair. And the baths were lost for a long time. They were only rediscovered in the modern era because people noticed that their, their, the basements of their houses kept flooding with hot water. And so, and so then in the, you know, in the 17th, 18th centuries, they were rediscovered. And oh right, there's a oh there's a hot spring here, and then you get the the building of the lovely Georgian buildings that are that are there to this day, but so so that nothing of the nothing of the Roman building survives. It was all lost. It's all been recreated in the modern era to look like Roman baths. But so the Romans had a, a timber bathhouse. Then at, at some point it was it would have been replaced with something more permanent in stone, and they also built a temple beside it. Because people would come from far and wide uh, to get help from the the goddess in all sorts of ways. So part of it would be drinking the water or bathing in the water for your health. Uh, it was also a great place to be seen for the Romans to go there and be seen lounging about, you know, eating good food, like a flash nightclub or a great restaurant or so. It was the place to be seen. And business, business would have been conducted and, and all the rest of it. From the Roman time onwards, you know, for, for, the, for the entirety of their, their stay in, in these islands, it was this glamorous location. And in the temple next door, people would come and they would bring a bull or a, or a sheep or a chicken and it would be sacrificed to Sulis. And then there, there were em, people employed there called augurs. You'd give them your bull and he would slaughter it for you and then he would read the entrails so you maybe go there when you were contemplating making a business trip to France if you're a, a merchant when would be an auspicious time to make the journey so you'd go to you'd go to Sulis slaughter the bull he'd, and he would tell you you know two weeks on Tuesday looks like a good time to me <laughs> according to what I can see here um, and, it, and it would either work out well for you or not. And you might go back and say, my trip was rotten. I had a rotten trip. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you'd expect the auger to give you some kind of explanation for, you know, for why his prognostication had, had gone wrong. So it was a multifaceted place for the Romans. And another way, I mean, really, as I said, you know, just the mere fact of the natural processes that create that water, I find uh, mind-bending. Uh, but another another way in which Bath is fantastic is because it lets you catch a glimpse of real human nature. Amongst m- a great wealth of material that archaeologists have found, things that have been put into the water there, they found little lead squares f- folded in half. And when they opened them up, they had little messages written on them in, in Latin. So, so Romans had been in the habit of getting a little square of lead, you know, a couple of inches square, writing something in it, folding it over, and then th- it's like, a, like a message to the to the goddess. And they're petty. It, they're called curse tablets. 
And it, it's right down to things like somebody stole my towel while I was having a bath. But, and they stole my clothes as well. Get them. Get them for me, goddess. I mean, I can, I can read you some. I mean, there's things like, um, I curse him who has stolen, who has robbed Dio Myrix from his house. Whoever stole his property, the God is to find him. Let him buy it back with his blood or his own life. And then another one, another one, another curse tab that says, may he who stole Vilbia, that'll be a woman, may he who stole Vilbia from me become as liquid as water. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of these curse tablets. They, they give you this lovely, perfect little, you know, th- thousands year old snapshot of people just being like people are. You, you know, coming, coming, coming back out the bath and some bugger's going away with your, your towel and your, <laughs> your jewellery and your clothes and there you are standing naked and cold. Curses. So you write, you write it down on a wee lead tablet. Get them for me. Get them for me, Silas Minerva. I love that. I love how, how in, instantly, uh, it, how easy it is to identify with that and to just recognise the unchanging nature of human beings. So it's, it's, just this, it's just this treasure of a place. And of course, there's a modern bathhouse on the site and people go and they take, you know, high tea and they sit and they, you know, they, they have a drink and, you know, they, they have something nice to eat. And it's still a place where people want to be seen. You know, it, it has and it is in the 21st century still this special place in the landscape. But it's one of those locations you can tell that it has always mattered. And fundamentally, it's, it has always mattered in the same way. We are still impressed by the fact that there are h- hundreds of thousands of gallons of hot water coming out of the ground every day. It never stops. It has never stopped. And that, that amazes and amuses us with all our sophistication. And you can tell that, you know, the Romans, another modern sophisticated civilization, when they encountered it, they thought, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, this is where a goddess actually lives, they thought. And even before them, the locals, the Iron Age tribes of the area, knew that they had something very special there and were in the habit of offering up sacrifices and valuables and all the rest of it. And they, and they associated it with health because their goddess, Sulis, that eventually became sort of welded onto the side of Minerva, metaphorically speaking, uh, was, was all about well-being. So they had understood that, that connection between the water and, and well-being. And then you're left to your imagination at that point to go back into the mists of time and just contemplate. Or imagine living in a world, a Stone Age world, you know, a, a, a Paleolithic or a Mesolithic world. Imagine it's winter. You know, imagine the snow is on the ground. And then for the first time, you know, you walk into that cradle of hills and you see, first of all, the steam. Freezing cold, you're shivering. And you see the steam. What's that? And you've, you venture down. And then, event- and then the ground gets marshy and boggy. And as you, as you penetrate further and further into this space, you get to the point where the water is hot, rising up, just ra- bubbling up out of the ground, hot enough that you can get into it and get warm. And it's got a different colour. Imagine what effect that would have on you, because you absolutely haven't, if you've been all around Europe in your meanderings and all over the British Isles, you have not seen anything like that before because it's unique and how special a place that would be that you could go to the place in the landscape where the world herself seemed to be bleeding The Romans were here for nearly 400 years so did these isles change and influence them? Yeah, you know, as we were saying at the be- at the beginning there, this I you know I was always slightly defensive about the idea that we needed to wait for the Romans before we got civilization. I mean, civilization is one of those c words of archaeology. It's like culture. It's it, it makes it makes people jumpy because it means different, slightly different things to different people. It's hard to get consensus about what civilization actually means. I mean, etymologically, you're really talking about towns, cities. 
people gathering together in that sort of urbanised way, that that's, for most people, or a lot of people, that's what civilization's all about. But if you loosen the bounds of what civilization means, if, it, if it's a sort of a social sophistication you're talking about and, and people relating to one another in sophisticated, well-organised ways. So I was always a bit wary of of this suggestion that it took the Romans to make us a civilised country. When the Romans came here, they were undoubtedly, those Romans that came here and lived out their lives here, or they were, they were changed. In the same way, I mean, you could say that the metaphor is in the same way that the rain that fell, that, that percolated down through the rock, was, was warmed, and it, it picked up all these minerals and other elements. And by the time it returned to the surface, it was altogether different because of that process of percolation and and just being affected by the by the stuff of the place and i would say that the the romans likewise like that rain were were changed by the time they spent passing through the british landscape so that the british romans were were a different sort of roman Were any of the major Roman figures, in part, made by their time in these islands? It's fun, apart from anything else, to speculate about individuals. And Constantine was made Roman emperor while he was at York. His father, Constantius, who was the Roman emperor, died. And Constantine was in York, so he became, you know, by that process of inheritance, that, you know, the king is dead, long live the king... Constantine was now the emperor while he was in York. But of course, Constantine had to go back to Rome and fight for for what he believed was his. And on the eve of the crucial battle, which was the Battle of Milvian Bridge, legend has it that Constantine looked up at the sky and saw a cross and heard or saw the words more or less, if you use this symbol, you will triumph. So he had his men put the cross on their uniforms, paint it on or stitch it on or whatever, and he was victorious. And his position as, as emperor of, of Rome was secured. And it was Constantine who went through the processes, to cut a long story short, that ended up with the Christian religion becoming the official religion of the, or a tolerated religion of the Roman Empire. He was the emperor that summoned the, the conference at Nicaea that produced the Nicene Creed, that, that's a foundational text of, of what the Catholic Church became. So he was a Roman who had, who had been affected in whatever ways by being in the British archipelago. And he, he it was, for good or ill, and for, for whatever his real intentions actually were, it was he that legitimised the Christian religion at a time when the Christian religion could have gone over the hill into history and been crushed and disappeared, he made it, he secured its future. And after his time, it became the world-dominating religion that, that, that was the Catholic Church. So, so without Constantine, what if? What if there had been no Constantine? What if he had spent time somewhere else? What if he had been somewhere else when he became emperor? It's one of those sliding doors things, you know. But in any event, it was he was in the British Isles, and part of his makeup was on account of his having been in the British Isles. That was part of what made him the man that he was, part of what made him the Roman Emperor that he was. So something like the the the, the British Isles may have actually had a part to play in securing the destiny of the Christian religion. Because without Constantine and his actions, it might all have been fundamentally different. You just don't know. But he was made, in part, he was, in part he was made the person that he was by time spent in the British archipelago. After that marvellous what if, uh, are you going to go and run a bath and put the <laughs> bath salts in? It's just not the same. There's bathing and then there's bath. I love it. I do. I mean, you've been there. I can. You've been in Bath. I. I just love it. It looks wonderful, but for me, it all boils down to. Pardon the pun. It all boils down to the fact that that 
that aroma, that kind of sulfurous smell, and that water at that temperature has flown constantly and consistently for an immeasurable period of time. And when you're in that place, smelling that smell and feeling that temperature, you're smelling a smell and feeling the temperature of something that Romans did, Roman people. So it's one of those places in the landscape where I just allow myself into feeling that I've got a physical connection with another time. The largest Roman artefact anywhere in the world. 70 miles long, six years in the making an engineering feat of note. Interspersed by forts, a powerful wall dividing this long island from east to west. Built in a time before there were any such people as the Scots or the English. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. Check out my Instagram account it's called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And to ensure you get each new episode of the podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and share with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. The music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research was carried out by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios. And the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these islands such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>